Ruth Starcher is 923. Jerry Moss is on 925. And Paula Smith is on 925 also. And this month for anniversaries, it's uh, Ka Carol and my 20th anniversary on the 23rd of this year. Um, so for an anniversary gift, my wife is going to live in Las Vegas. So, so she's gotten a new job, but this is uh, the gift that I get that keeps giving. Um. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? <laughs> so if you'd like to join now, we're going to stand and join in our call to worship as found in the bulletin. Our help stands in the name of the Lord, who has made heaven and earth. When I was in trouble called upon the Lord, and he heard me. The Lord himself is your keeper. The Lord is your defense upon your right hand. Praise and glory to our everlasting God. Please join in singing hymn number 68, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Please continue standing and join in the prayer of invocation in unison. Let us begin. O oh God, source of all pure desires and holy affections, give us now quiet minds and reverent hearts that we may worthily worship you at this time. Amen. Please be seated. Please continue joining in the prayer of confession again in unison. Let us begin. O oh God, from whom no secrets are hid, search our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Bring to our awareness those sins we have committed against your infinite goodness. Forgive us and help us to walk this day in the light. 
Deliver us from our timid silences. Save us in thought, word, and deed from the peril of our self-deception. Hear now our silent prayers seeking forgiveness. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather in your name today, we thank you for this beautiful day, last Sunday of summer, beautiful day indeed. We're grateful for that and also for your love, your grace, and your mercy experienced again this past week, and always for your forgiveness available to us upon our confession of its need. And truly, we're needy individuals in that regard. So we ask for your cleansing of every and all sin and a refilling of your spirit that we might uh, live lives pleasing and honoring you and offer worship that is also honoring, and glorifying, and encouraging, uplifting to those who are gathered one another as we reach out in your name. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. beautiful day indeed it is and we had another very nice day last Sunday and thank you by the way those of you that brought food and participated in the picnic last week we were almost back to pre-pandemic period inside and outside we had a church full of people and everybody was enjoying the food and the fellowship pastor Josh said you know you got some good cookers and grillers there yeah I said you got that right Absolutely. So we thank, uh, we thank you all for making that possible. Always look forward to the picnic. And as you notice out here, the hedge keeps, keeps looking better. And that's because uh, Paula and Doreen laying hands on it. They uh, trimmed it and they put mulch down. Those girls are some girls, let me tell you. Debbie says she thinks they just go around looking for things to do. And uh, I... Maybe Paul's recovering from that today. I don't know. But, uh, and Greg and Mary Claire, as uh, Anthony said, Greg got attacked and bit by a raccoon in his backyard as they were getting ready to go off on a camping trip. Uh, the police department came by and dispatched the raccoon. Turned out to be rabid. And uh, Greg is now getting the shots. Uh, so just pray for um, his uh, healing and getting over that experience. Uh, raccoon got him pretty good. He said it was a big one, and uh, uh, their backyard is sort of a little bit confined there, but the raccoon, uh, raccoon, nothing to be messed with. So uh, if you see any raccoons, just make some noise, but that one was apparently a rabbit and, uh, and attacked him. So our thoughts and prayers are with Greg today and uh, for full recovery from that. And uh, for Greg and Mary Claire, as they were celebrating their, their wedding, I think it's their 40th wedding anniversary. So as Anthony mentioned, next week is the tag sale. Uh, we're, we're totally filled up here. Uh, and uh, it's just a community event that we do that brings the community together. Uh, help to set up and take down, as Anthony said, is always appreciated. I come by and meet some neighbors and uh, pick up some stuff you don't need. Get rid of some things you do have. <laughs> and um, one other announcement I'm going to make about Saturday uh, shred and Recycle Days, the Milford Bank, uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, or until the two trucks are filled up. Free electronic recycling, free document shredding, 
for customers. Now, if you're not a customer of the Milford Bank, and I serve on the board, so I would encourage you to support our local bank, uh, there's a small fee, $5, and they donate that to a nonprofit. And I've been on the receiving end of that in the past, so uh, that's a small fee. But uh, I have underneath our bed statements and bills. So I says to Dave, how long do I need to keep this stuff? And Dave said, what, three years, three years. So if you're like me, you got stuff you don't want to put out in the trash, need to shred it, Milford Bank parking lot, 9 a.m. to 12 noon. And uh, like I say, a small fee there for uh, if you're not a customer. If you'd like to become a customer, see me after the service. <laughs> All right, my wife says, oh my gosh, okay. Time for the offering. But I know, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone. I trust, O oh Lord, in thee. Amen. As Anthony said during the announcements today, it's Ed Patrick Murphy's birthday. He would have been 86 years old. Ed usually sat over there. I wish we had a recording of his laugh. <laughs> he had a great laugh. And uh, in that regard, he was a typical Irishman. He really was. Had a hearty laugh. Uh, he passed on January the 21st of this past year. We lost two good ones. Jenny Kelsey and Ed. Um, when I got here, um, I used to come here and speak uh, as a guest speaker back in, in the early part of this uh, millennium. Um, Ed was uh, chair of the church council. Uh, Jenny was uh, the lady that did the announcements and did the bulletins. Uh, we had Marilyn, who was the head of the deacons, and Lee, and uh, we had... Uh, People like uh, Sandy and Verna and the LaPlante family, uh, some, some of the old timers, some of the old timers that uh, kept this church going over the years. And um, Ellie, you were, you were here, but you weren't a member yet at that point, right? Okay. And Bev, were you attending at that time? No. Okay. Did I miss anybody else that's, that's currently here? Uh, I want to do that. Okay. Um, so I spoke here uh, in August 10 years ago, uh, 
Pastor John Thursby was the pastor at that time. And um, he said to me, uh, I understand your wife is an accompanist. Uh, our, our, our pianist organist is getting kind of frail. Uh, could she come and fill in? Well, Debbie started playing regularly. Uh, and so I would drop her. We'd go to 830 service over at Calvary Church. And then uh, she would come and play here. Sometimes I stayed and sometimes I would move on. But uh, got to know the, the congregation uh, pretty well. I think uh, when Pastor John announced his retirement, the church had done a search uh, for a new pastor, and uh, after after some time, Ed asked me to have breakfast with him, and he said uh, to me, would you consider being our pastor? And I said, you know, I always thought that in my semi-retirement days, I'd be the pastor of a little white church in a village. <laughs> and I said, this is a little white church, and up here in Norgate Avenue, it's like, like a village, right? So I said, sorry. Yes, God already spoke to me about that, but I was just waiting for somebody to say something. But uh, having breakfast, and by the way, um, I'll never forget this. He had a double order of bacon, <laughs> and he told me not to tell Doreen. <laughs> She's back there shaking her head. I remember, double order of bacon. <laughs> anyway, um, I thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Ed and uh, working with him with the church council in uh, the years that uh, we, he was able to participate. And, and, and he stayed very active as long as he could. I'd like to read uh, the obituary that uh, no doubt Doreen and uh, Dawn wrote up very well. Ed Patrick Murphy, 85 at that time of Milford, beloved husband of 54 years to Doreen, Murphy passed away peacefully on Thursday, January 21st, born September 19, 1935 in Boston, Mass. Ed was the son of the late Edward and Marie Murphy. Ed is a graduate of Milford High School. Shortly thereafter, proudly served his country in the United States Marine Corps. And that's a handsome picture there of the Marine. Wonderful picture of Ed. Upon leaving the service, he was employed by the Norton Division of United Technology in the area of field service and sales, eventually hiring his wife to be as his secretary. Hit on his secretary, he did. <laughs> absolutely. Well, 54 years later, they were married, absolutely, all those years. They both left their work at Norton five years later and began a family to fulfill Ed's desire to run his own business, which he did opening the Salt Meadow Shell Service Station and Auto Repair Lordship Boulevard, Stratford. Ed loved all things Boston Red Sox and the Yukon women's basketball team, yes. He had a lifelong passion for nature and the outdoors and spent many vacations as possible, camping, canoeing, hiking, fishing, exploring, bringing his family and anyone interested in joining the caravan. That was up in New Hampshire, right? The Vermont, okay. Uh, one of my favorite stories is this story with Ed and uh, the outhouse. <laughs> and he got attacked by bees that had taken up residence. Uh, he would tell that story and he would just, just start laughing. It was funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> uh, he was an enthusiastic contributor to the life of Wilmer Beach Congregational Church over the years, serving as church council president, deacon, lay leader, choir member, prayer warrior. And he remained an active participant as long as he could. Ultimately, Ed cherished any time spent with family and friends, often strangers alike, enjoying conversations, stories, and laughter. In addition to his loving wife, Ed is survived by daughter and son-in-law, Dawn and Dan, and uh, brother-in-law in Florida, Marianne and Jim, Mary Ann and uh, Roland Jim Montgomery. Did I get that right? Okay. Including many cousins, nieces, and nephews, predeceased by a sister and brother in law, Alice and Robert. Family wishes to acknowledge the many gracious kindnesses offered to them during this time, beginning with the hospital staff, doctors, nurses, hospice care, friends, and family. And I got to add Clint, uh, who uh, helped out in many ways uh, over the years. 
uh, uses training and expertise and was just a great friend. Uh, there was going to be a memorial service for Red, but uh, like during the pandemic, a number of things like that did not happen. So we did have uh, some recognition of the uh, life of Ed in the February 14th service, but very appropriate today on his uh, birthday uh, for the church. Protestant churches don't have saints. We have pillars of the church, pillars of the church. And it's good to be reminded of these people and their service because uh, we're inspired by them. And uh, we're here because of them. 126 years, uh, many people have served. Ed, Ed was one of, those, one of those people, along with those others that I've mentioned. So um, I'm going to ask the Deacon Clint to come up at this time um, and share some remarks. Uh, Clint's always an entertaining speaker. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see that they were they were real buds. They were real but they were real buds. So you know you have to edit out. You could be here for hours, I know, but oh, uh, I didn't want to interfere <laughs> with the uh, sermon. So, <laughs> <laughs> but feel free to share. Feel uh, free to share. You. Thank Absolutely. You, thank you. And uh, good morning. Welcome. Uh, Ed was my friend. That's uh, I make that perfectly clear. He was a friend. And there, though there was a generation. Between us, there's an age difference. It never came into play. He, he treated me as an equal. You know, sometimes we get, can you hear me okay? Am I doing this right? Technology. Back in the old days, we didn't have this. We just used to have to talk very loud. Um, we never felt that we had that gap in age. Uh, he treated me like an equal and I treated him as an equal. Uh, sometimes when you get older, you have a tendency to say, you know, you young guys, uh, back when I was young, you know, when the snow would pile up to the eaves and I had to walk uphill both ways in school, he never did any of that stuff. I, I'm finding myself starting to say that, so that's, I guess that's a bad sign. But anyways, Ed never did it with me here. We were equal. I came to this church in the early 1980s. I was a young man, kind of not... I had some issues. Sketchy, <laughs> sketchy, <laughs> sketchy. So I met this gentleman named Ed Murphy, and I found out that Ed uh, had some issues. <laughs> <laughs> and when I look at that picture there, yeah, I know why. So my, my, my mom had a picture of me in a uniform, and she'd hang it on the wall. I said, oh, that's my son. I said, Mom, please, put that away. He embarrassed me. Ed and I went through, um, we, we talked about everything that you can possibly imagine from early childhood right on up through. We studied scripture together. We took the courses together through Reverend Inlow over here at this building next door. Um, you may not know that used to belong to the church. That was the parsonage. Uh, we had sold it, and Ed was part of, part of that committee, but... The programs that we went through, the studying of scripture, um, we grew together. And from there we went and we took it on the road, if you would. Uh, wherever we had a chance to bring the gospel, that's where we brought the gospel. Um, and I'll tell you a few stories. Actually, let me ask a quick question. How many have actually met Ed? Oh, yeah, good, good amount. Okay, good, good. I just, uh, sometimes I'm, you know. Just assume everybody knows him, but you may not have known him. So uh, Pastor Ken painted a great picture when you read the obituary of who Ed was. What we did together, um, I wouldn't be where I am today, I don't believe, if it had not been for Ed and a few others. He played a role in my life that was unbelievable. And he helped get purpose and meaning and direction. And we grew together. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories before, because uh, I, I, I don't want to cut into the service, uh, the sermon. That, that's, uh, I also want to leave it up. If anybody else has anything they want to add, please come up and, and, and say. This, is, this time is being set aside to honor um, Ed, our friend, our brother, our fellow servant in the Lord. So if anybody does have anything they want to say, please come on up. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Here's how we rolled. We would go out. Usually we'd go to breakfast, we would have bacon, 
That, <laughs> that, that came into play every time. Right? And then we would go somewhere and we would either pray, study scripture, or we would witness. A couple of places we wound up uh, preaching the gospel in an unlikely place is like a biker bar. So we decided one day, because Doreen would say, what are you guys doing? And I would tell her, uh, we're going to go get drunk. We're going to go drink. Right. right? And then we'd take off. So one day I said to Ed, I said, hey, let's stop for a beer. He goes, that's a good idea. So we stopped for a beer, and we're at the bar, and we start witnessing the people in the bar. Now, God says plant the seed, he gives growth. Whether or not anything ever grew, I don't know. But we sure had fun while we were doing it. <laughs> people looked at us and said, we've never heard it presented that way before. That was the beauty of it. They never heard the gospel presented like that before. Did it go? I don't know. That's in God's hands. Uh, the work on the church here. Uh, we would come down and we'd do some work on the church. We'd usually come in here, we would pray for a while, and then we would do our thing. So, I'll tell you the story. I don't know if Doreen knows. Um, I, I got Ed stuck up on the roof of the church one night. <laughs> so, up here, at the very highest point, he's up there. Now, he's getting a little older, so he wasn't as agile. He wanted to go up because we had to roof. Lee's not in here. Right? We had the roof replaced one time, but we had to go up and do some inspection. So Ed comes up with me, and he's straddling the peak. Right? And we do what we got to do. I say, all right, let's go down. So I start to slide down. That's a steep roof up there. And uh, so I start to go down, and he's still sitting there. I go, Ed, what are you doing? He goes, I'm, I can't get down. I'm stuck. I go, well, lift your leg up. Just Lift it up and go like that, right? Well, he can't. He, if you know Ed's, he was like a short, stocky little guy like this, right? And he would always lean into things. So he's straddling the peak, and he's leaning as he's going. I said, Ed, don't do that. You're going to fall. He goes, I did just kick your leg over like that. So he's leaning. I go, stop, stop. And then he's like this, and he goes, I'm going to fall. So over he goes. And he starts to roll down the roof. And I go, oh my, I go, roll to the flat side. <laughs> right? So he goes, right? And then he like stops halfway. But he was over towards the flat spot over there. And in the meantime, he's laughing. Right? That laugh you were talking about? He's laughing, like a good Irishman should. So he's on the roof, almost over there. I said, Ed, just roll that way, because if you go that way, you're gonna shoot off the end. And we're done. And all I thought was, my God, what am I going to tell Doreen? All I'm going to do is get in my car, and I'm going to drive. And I'm going to leave. I'll never come back. All right? It's over. So this was a common event wherever we went. Usually, Ed got himself in a situation, and I had to get him out quickly. But along the way, the love of God, the respect and the admiration, that we shared together. Um, I, I cannot put it into words. I don't have enough, I, 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 don't, I just cannot put it into words. Towards the end, as he got weaker, our last time out, we went um, to breakfast, had bacon, <laughs> <laughs> and we came by and we stopped here in the parking lot on a, a weekday, nobody was around, and we just sat in the parking lot and we reminisced. 30 years, three decades with that man I spent. I grew with him as a, as a Christian. I grew as a man. He was my brother and my friend. And we sat there and we just talked and you were two old salty dogs crying like babies about what a life we had together. And I did know that that was probably going to be, that was the last time he and I were going to be on the road. I, I knew that. And then his health started to deteriorate, but his spirit never did. And that's the lesson that I want all of us to take away today. I think that would be uh, what Ed would want said. Yeah. I got tired, I got weak, but my spirit got stronger. And that spirit of Ed is with us today. That, um, that determination to be a servant, a child of God, of Jesus Christ. And uh, 
haven't been, and uh, I call myself kind of an, ad an adopted Murphy. <laughs> All right. Uh, my goal was to torment Dorn. I, I tormented Dawn for, for decades. Thank you, Dawn. You took it well. Uh, we've gone camping together. And, uh, oh, I got to tell you one more story. I'm sorry. Is it okay? Do I got a minute? No? Oh, okay. All right. You good? All right. <laughs> Ed was in the hospital. Up at, I think it was St. Ray's. All right. So here's how it goes. Only family can come in. He had, he was in the cardiac cath lab. So only family can come in. So I show up at the door. They go, are you family? I go, oh yeah. I go, I'm the illegitimate stepchild. And I just walk by, <laughs> right? So the nurse, the wheels are turning. She's like, I don't know what he just said, but okay. So I go in and I see Ed. I go, Ed, what are you doing? And he starts laughing. I go, Ed, listen to me. You just came out of cardiac cath, all right? They put the, uh, the wire up through the femoral artery and into the, the heart, all right? You're not supposed to move. You're supposed to lay still like this. They have a weight on you, okay? Because you don't want that plug to pop open. You can start bleeding pretty bad. So he's laughing. And, and if you've known him, for those folks that know him, he's like a ball of jelly, right? <laughs> he just starts like vibrating. I said, Ed, I didn't say anything yet. So now he starts laughing even more. I go, if that hole pops down there, right? You're going to bleed like a sieve. I got to put my hand down there and shove my finger in there to stop the bleeding, right? What do you think Doreen's going to think if she walks through the door and I got my hand up your Johnny coat on your thigh? It ain't going to look good. Now he's an absolute out of control laughing. I'm going, oh man, I'm going to be responsible for this guy bleeding to death. Stop it. Anyways, he, he didn't bleed to death. Right? But he had a good time. Goodbye. Did you know that? You didn't know any of that, did you? Uh, or you had you suspected? <laughs> Just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean you can't laugh. Matter of fact, we should be laughing all the time. Take a lesson from Ed. That's how you're going to live your Christian life. Let that spirit of laughter and joy come through. Okay? Let it affect other people. Ed was contagious with this. And I'm so thankful for it. And I'm going to be quiet now. And uh, I want to thank you all for sharing um, this time with us and um, letting me speak freely about my friend who I love with all my heart. And I love his family. And I promised Ed that I will watch over them. I will protect them and for always, always be in my heart and in my prayers. And... Uh, with that, if anybody else wants to come up, I'm going to leave the mic here, and I'm going to fade away. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I don't know if you want to go sit next to Doreen. You're not. <laughs> uh, but anybody else have anything to add? We could tell more stories. Yes, Anthony. So, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Anthony. <laughs> exactly. And one of the things that used to happen whenever I would say my name, I have a habit of saying Anthony Cruz or Cruz Electric, and you know, when I leave a message. So, Ed, during my mom's funeral, my sister asked me to do a eulogy. And I came up to do the eulogy, and those that were here would remember, because I stood up and said, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Anthony Cruz. And there's Ed laughing, Anthony Cruz of Cruz Electric. <laughs> and then it just starts this whole thing going on. My, my client that came from New Canaan yells out my cell phone number. <laughs> and then someone else yells out, you know, uh, don't call me, I'll call you. And then someone else is yelling out, leave a, leave a message and I'll kindly return a call at my convenience. And then, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the eulogy and I'm sitting here and, and then I finally said, I said, you know, I wrote a eulogy out. And then my client yells, he doesn't write anything out, check it, it probably only has his name on it. <laughs> and I mean, this is my mom's funeral and everyone's laughing and I'm just standing there saying, okay. Thank you, God, because the love just comes through everyone, you know, and that was what he shared in his laughter and in his smiles. 
I never, ever forget that. I couldn't be anywhere saying my name because he would be in the corner yelling out of Cruise Electric. And it always, <laughs> and you, you couldn't help but laugh, you know what I mean? But that's just the, the experience I had with that. What a wonderful experience. Me coming here when Pastor Ken, when you got voted in, yeah. and you know, seeing the members, sitting in my first council meeting, and when they talked about the budget, and I'd raised my hand and said, is the decimal point in the wrong place? Because I've never heard of a budget that efficient, you know? And, and he's just saying, no, he goes, you know, we run a very, you know, efficient church here. We, we try to live within our means. And just learning, learning how to behave and, and be a better person. So, man, thank you. Did I see another hand back here anywhere or something? But well, we're going to have some food after the service and some more stories, I'm sure, and sharing uh, dur during that time, okay? Um, Ed, as we mentioned, was an Irishman, and uh, I'm going to read, and Deborah's going to play this Irish blessing, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard it sometime, but uh, some wonderful words to this. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face, the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. May the sun make your days bright. May the stars illuminate your nights. May the flowers bloom along your path, your house stand firm against the storm. And until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Until we meet again, until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. song and I know you're glad I didn't sing it <laughs> I read it and Deborah played it but uh, yes a wonderful song Ed's memory so um, I decided to preach today I think it relates to the person we we're just talking about Nehemiah one of my favorite books of the Bible Nehemiah is the last of the historical books. Now, I know that in the Hebrew and Christian canon, Esther is after that, but Esther really belongs to and goes with Ezra, the book of Ezra, which is before Nehemiah. The time period is the post-exilic period, 5th century B.C. The Jews had been allowed to return to Judah after 70 years in captivity, under Cyrus, other the Medes and the Persians. Ezra, the book Ezra, Ezra was a priest and a scribe. And he had returned with those that had gone back. And um, he put in a number of reforms to deal with falling away. There was intermarriage with heathens and temple worship wasn't happening. Ezra, priest and a scribe, put in a number of reforms. The altar and the temple was rebuilt in Ezra chapter 3, but not the city walls. Now, Nehemiah, who was Nehemiah? He was not a priest. He was not a scribe. He was not a prophet. He was just what you would call a layman, but he was a high-placed person in the Persian court. He was an official at the high position of the king's cupbearer. Now, what did that entail? King's cupbearer bore the cup, cup of wine, over to the king. 
but it was his responsibility to make sure that nobody had poisoned the wine. So he had to guard the wine and to make sure that it was safe to drink, the cupbearer had to drink the wine first. And then if he didn't keel over, <laughs> it was safe for the king to drink. So Nehemiah, who was a Hebrew, was in this high position serving the king and um, he was the cupbearer. The king was um, Artaxerxes and he was a son of Xerxes but he was the king and Nehemiah was his cupbearer. Now Nehemiah's brother, this is in chapter 1, his brother Hanani comes back from Jerusalem, Judea, along with some other men. They had gone back with the Jewish remnant. They had survived the exile. And then they returned back to Persia, to Susa. Susa was about 150 miles east of Babylon. And that would be in the modern country of Persia today known as Iran. I think we all hear about Iran, Persia, the biblical name. Nehemiah's brother comes back, and he relates to him the sad situation in Jerusalem. How the walls of the city had fallen down, and the gates of the city uh, had been destroyed by fire. Number of gates. So, while the altar had been restored by Ezra, and the temple had been rebuilt, the walls of the city had been fallen down and were in that state for about 150 years. Now, when Nehemiah hears this, we read this. When he heard about what had happened, Nehemiah sat down and wept, verse 4. Sat down and wept when he heard about the sad situation city of Jerusalem. And next, what did he do? He had a prayer. And I'm going to read this prayer. It's in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5 to verse 11. And I want you to notice um, his appeal. And his prayer involved a confession. And I want you also to see how he recognized and addressed God. O Lord, God of heaven, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive, let your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. He's praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people who are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and Bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling in my name. So hearing about the situation in Jerusalem, in Judea, he was moved to tears. And he was also moved to do something, pray. One of the most powerful things we could ever do for our country is to pray. Now we have all these hacking heads on TV wringing our hands and you have the division in the country and whatever else, but uh, who suggests that maybe as a nation we ought to pray for our leaders? We ought to pray for our country in this time of the pandemic, this time of all the issues, whether it's Afghanistan or the southern border, etc. The most important thing we can do is to pray for our country, and that's what Nehemiah did. And you notice in his prayer, he has a confession. He confesses 
his sin, sins of his father, and the sins of his countrymen. We want the God to hear our prayers. We've got to come clean first. And that's why in a congregational style of worship, we always have a prayer confession at the beginning of the worship service. You don't find that in many churches today. You have a lot of worship and a lot of praise and a lot of love, and but very little confession. Confession of sin. Confess that he was part of the problem. And he appealed to God, the God of the heavens, and he cites back to God, God's word. If you want to make your prayers powerful, include in your prayers God's word, his promises, things he has said, things he's done in the past. The order and argument of prayer, Charles Spurgeon called it. He quoted back to God, God's own word about how if people are unfaithful, by the way, there's always consequences to sin. There are consequences to sin. And here the consequence was that God's people were going to be scattered. That's why the captivity took place. First under the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. People were scattered. He said, if you're unfaithful, you'll be scattered. But if you return and obey, you will be gathered. And indeed, gathered from the furthest parts of the earth horizon. Brought back to the land, back to Judea. He said, your servants, the people that you've redeemed. Redeemed means to be bought back. God having created us, sin, we're his children. He makes it possible for us to be redeemed or purchased or bought back, restored. He says, O oh Lord... Lend your ear. Be attentive to the prayer of your servant who delights in revering your name. And he cited that he prayed day and night. These are your servants, people you redeemed. Great strength and mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer. This your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today in granting him favor in the presence of this man. In the presence of this man. Who was that? That would be the king, our tax Xerxes. Now, he's going to approach the king with a request. But I want you to notice how this happened. This is the king that he was serving as a ring bearer, as a cup bearer. That's mentioned at the very end, last Part of chapter one. You know, chapter divisions were added, were added later. So the end of chapter one really goes with the beginning of chapter two. I was a cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Ataxerxes, when the wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad? Why are you, are you, when, you, when you're not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart. So the king, seeing his servant, knew he wasn't sick, but his face showed that he was very sad. By the, your, your eyes are the window of the heart. Your face in the ear. You know, when you look downcast, people say, hey, what's going on? What's going on? What's happening with you? That's what the king here said to Nehemiah. So now, what did Nehemiah do? He has a chance to speak to the king and unburden himself. First thing he does <laughs> is he says a quick prayer. <laughs> you know, your prayers don't have to be long. It's, it's the passion and the feeling behind it. And, and I'm sure he said, Lord, <laughs> give me the right words. Give me the right words to say at this time, right? Uh, he said, I was a concerned. I was afraid because he's speaking to the king. So he says to this, may the king live forever. Pretty smart thing to do if you're addressing the king. Start off with that. May the king live forever after issuing that prayer, quick prayer. Should not my face look sad when I hear about the city my fathers are buried, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by the fire, by fire. So the king says, 
what is it that you want? Wow, what is it that you want? The king's saying, how can I help? What is it that you want? Now he answers the king, and it says that the king was sitting there with his queen beside him. He says, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant should find favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my father's house, uh, where my father is buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? Because he was a valued servant, right? He wanted to know, how long are you going to need to go away, and when are you going to be back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors in that area, so that they may provide with me a safe conduct when I arrive in Judea. And may I have a letter uh, to also the keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors there and issued those, showed those letters. And the king also sent army officers and the cavalry with him. That helped, having a little presence there backed up uh, in that. So you notice that uh, Nehemiah has this opportunity to speak to the king about what was burdening his heart. He had specific things. When you, when you address somebody in authority, when you, when you speak to God, pray specifically and have your requests, have them thought out and, and get right to the point exactly what it is that you need. Be specific. And he says the gracious hand of God was with him so that the king granted him these requests for safe travel, and for access to the timber um, to rebuild the citadel and the walls. Now, this all sounds good, except when we get to chapter 2, verse 10, we read about this guy, Sanbat, Aronite, and Tobiah, the Amorite, officials who heard about this, they were very much disturbed that somebody would come and promote the welfare of the Israelites. Not everybody was happy with this development. They were quite, these neighboring tribes and people were quite happy to see Jerusalem be in a state of disrepair. And they weren't happy to hear that it was going to be rebuilt. I once had uh, an elected representative tell me, he said, Ken, you know, you never can help a group of constituents and not hurt somebody else. I said, how is that? He said, well, if you're helping one group of constituents, the other people are saying, well, you're taking that money and giving it to them. You should give us some money and do some things for us. Or you're taking our taxes and you're giving it to those people. So he said, you can never help a group of constituents that it doesn't have some detrimental effect on others. I understand that. Okay, that's a good point. I'll give you an example. When I was uh, the CEO of Boys and Girls Village, we needed to build some, some new buildings. Uh, the state had asked us to get back into the residential program again, and what we had there was buildings that had been sad repair. So I made an appeal to the governor and to the bond commission for $2 million. That was 20 years ago, so it would be like $4 million a day. And uh, I had a pretty strong argument when we were doing the work of this state, and we were doing it cheaper than what the state was able to do, and we were taking care of the state's children, and so I asked for $2 million. Each building was going to cost a million dollars each plus other costs. Now, some other nonprofits got wind of this, and they weren't too happy about that. They said, why is the Boys Village hog it up and get all $2 million? Why, do, why don't we get some of that money if the state has the money available? You give us, give them 500000 and give us a couple hundred thousand and give them a couple hundred thousand. And so some of the other nonprofits weren't too happy about it. And then on top of that, the Hartford Current Big article on the top of the op-ed page. Want to know how did this guy Fellenbaum get $2 million from the governor and the bond commission? Who is this guy anyway? Little agency down in Milford. 
And then he did a little research and found that the uh, police commissioner of the city and also vice chairman of the state ethics commission. So now this writer goes on, he says, what does he know? What dirt has he got on this governor that he's able to get the governor to give him $2 million? This big article, okay? People weren't happy. Some people weren't happy. I mean, people of Boys Village were happy. My board was happy. But uh, some of the nonprofits and some of the people up in Hartford, they weren't happy about that. So there was these people, surrounding people, surrounding governors, weren't happy to hear that the king had given authorization, given help to Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, here's the point. Don't be surprised when you're doing the work of God if you get some opposition from somebody. Don't be surprised. The devil's not going to be happy when you're looking to build up the church. He's, not, he's going to be quite happy to see the church is struggling or just barely getting by or having to close. Devil's, devil's not happy to hear about things going great in the kingdom of God and the church being rebuilt and growing. Now, what I inherited here, the church building, the roof, the roof was in good shape, as you mentioned. The roof had been redundant. The windows had been replaced, so the physical plant was, was certainly serviceable. But the numbers of people had dwindled. Now, I know that it was Ed's great desire, Ginny and all the rest, Lee and Marilyn, that uh, the church be flourish and grow again. And uh, very happy to see that indeed happening. But, you know, not everybody is happy. Not er and don't be surprised when you're doing God's work if you're going to get some opposition from somebody else. Even sometimes from other Christians. Or so-called Christians. Or professed Christians. And certainly not the devil. Now, Nehemiah arrives and he goes to inspect the city walls. And he's there for three days. And then he goes out at night with a few people on his horse. And he, he goes out the valley gate. And he goes around the city to inspect these fallen down walls. You notice he goes at night because he doesn't want to be seen. And he hadn't told anybody what he had in mind. But then he gathers together the priests and the nobles and the officials. And he points out to them in verse 17. He says, we got a, we got a problem here. We got a problem here. The city walls have been fallen down. The gates have been destroyed. The city is left defenseless. That's a problem. Took this outsider who came back to point this out to them. They, they saw that, but they, they hadn't been doing anything about it. So, why didn't they say something? I mean, they were living there. They saw it, but took this outsider. You know, sometimes we get so used to living in our house or whatever. Somebody else walks in, sees it differently than what we do. Or same with, even with our, our church building or property or whatever. Okay. So it took this person coming from distance away to point out the trouble. What was the trouble? The city walls had fallen down. So he suggests that uh, they need to get together and rebuild the walls. Come, let us rebuild the walls. Verse 17. So it would no longer be a disgrace. And he tells them about how the gracious hand of God had been upon him, led the king to support him with the letters of introduction as well as for the timber and all that. Now, in verse 18, they respond by saying, let us start the rebuilding. Let us start the rebuilding. So they began to do this good work. Now, this is an example of leadership. Leadership is seeing a need or a or a problem, pointing this out, but also suggesting how it can be approached and dealt with, and, and encouraging and enlisting others to join in. Seeing a need, getting others to join in, and you have great leadership and fellowship. And together, the people all got together. And if you skip over a couple chapters, chapter six, they rebuilt the walls in 52 days. 52 days. Now, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, We've been there a number of times. There's plenty of stones and rocks there. So that wasn't a problem, getting the stones and the rocks. They needed them for the gates in that deep. Now, these guys that I mentioned, Sam Blatt and Tobiah, and also Yisham, who was an Arab, uh, surrounding governors, they, they, when they heard about this rebuilding, they started mocking and making fun. They started mocking and making fun when you heard about this. And they say, what are you doing? Uh, 
What, are you rebelling against the king? They thought that by building up Jerusalem, he was sort of like looking to break the province away from the king. So they were falsely accusing that. But, but they were making fun and they were mocking. And again, the point is that don't be surprised when you're doing the work of God that there is opposition to that. Don't be surprised by that. Now in verse 20, he says to them, this is what he says. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We as servants will start rebuilding. But as for you, you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic rights to it. Good message even in today about the situation in the Holy Land and in Jerusalem. So there was opposition, yes, to the rebuilding. But Nehemiah was used by God to come back and rebuild the walls, the defenses of the city, the walls and the gates of the city. And you're going to see next in chapter 3, as he rebuilt the gates, different groups of people were assigned to do the different gates. And the cooperation, everybody's cooperating. But this one man had the vision, saw the need, and was able to, yes, appeal to the king, get his support, but also then go to the local leaders and the people. And together, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So today, we're thinking about Ed Murphy, we're talking about the rebuilding of this church, filling the church up, growing the church. That was Ed's great desire, and that was what he charged me with as the council president, and when I was called to be the pastor of the church nine years ago. And so I thought it was appropriate today to talk about Nehemiah, as we are also celebrating the life of Ed Murphy. Leadership, seeing a need, pointing it out, getting others involved. Yes, there might be some opposition and whatever else, but plow forward doing what it is that God has laid upon our hearts. Let us close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this uh, history of Jerusalem and how you used Nehemiah to get the walls of the city rebuilt. He dealt with opposition for sure, but he was able to, by his leadership, enlist the aid and the help of the people. And together, in 52 days, they rebuilt the city walls that had been fallen down in that state for 150 years. Rebuilt the defenses of the city. And Lord, we live in a time in our country where there are many, many problems, many, many issues, a lot of trouble. Help us to, like Nehemiah, Begin with prayer, begin with confession, and to appeal to you for your aid and your help. And help us uh, to rebuild uh, this nation, yes, but more importantly, the families and the churches that make up this nation. That really is uh, our defense upon the onslaught of Satan and adversity uh, that uh, he would stir up. Uh, we ask to help your help in this even as you helped Nehemiah. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> our hymn before our times of prayer and sharing is number 484, Under His Wings I Am Safely Abiding. 484. <laughs>
and now Anthony Cruz of Cruz Electric. <laughs> we will return your call at his convenience. <laughs> we'll lead us in a time of joys and concerns. <laughs> so now we come to the part of our service where we share our joys and concerns. I'm going to ask for traveling mercies for Carol, who is going out to Las Vegas for the 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th uh, to a conference. Then is coming back. And Raymond, my son, is going to drive across country with her to uh, Las Vegas. So traveling mercies both for the conference and for uh, her move to Las Vegas. Um, also ask for um, prayers for Glenn, who's still bouncing back from his recovery, healing slowly. And Chris uh, Matola, good friend of mine, as those who know Chris, I call him the banker, but he's a client-facing portfolio manager, yeah, la da la da da he's a banker. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I just asked for uh, peace in his life with the things that he's going through. Is there anyone else with a prayer or concern? Dave, go ahead. Okay, we have one online. Uh, sister Cindy's sister, Sharon, asked for a prayer that she broke her heel and is having surgery. Sharon? Any other concerns? Uh, Beverly, up in front. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's see. I want to start. I want prayers for the residents over there at DeMeo Gardens. We've had two of the residents who have been vaccinated but have come down with the COVID. Fortunately, I believe one of them's all well and better. The other one's still under quarantine. So I pray for the safety of all the other residents. And one of the residents, our Gail Uberti, has been in and out of the hospital, and uh, we thought she was recovering, but we find now that she's back in the hospital. So prayers for her, too. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? I um, need prayers for my daughter-in-law, Maureen. Um, she came down with COVID, and she's extremely sick. Everybody else is tested, and we're all okay so so far. <laughs> we're staying away from her. And that was your daughter-in-law, Maureen, right? Laurie? Well, I have an announcement and a joy. I would like to get next year uh, all people together and go camping. So more of a group thing. And Tom and I had already talked to the pastor about it. Sounds good. I might go myself. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. I can find an air mattress. <laughs> the ground got a lot harder here over the years. Yeah. Um, I just like prayers. My son Scott, his sugars have been like over 500. Um, they thought he had pancreatitis. Now they think it's H. pylori. Um, so he's been battling all week with ups and downs with his sugar. And your son's name is? Scott. Scott. Are there any other prayers or concerns that anyone would like to pray for? That will be all. Then we ask for, that you pray for these people during your private prayer time or as we pray together in the church. So a reminder also to pray for Greg's recovery from that uh, rabid raccoon attack and also for the effectiveness of those shots and uh, for everybody to stay safe um, in this uh, crazy time. You know, a year ago we thought we were going to be coming out of the woods and uh, keeps coming back in some form or another. So uh, keep being careful and keep being safe. Let us pray. Lord God, we, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We saw the example of a uh, successful prayer of Nehemiah, of how he appealed to you, and you heard and answered his prayer, and it uh, gave him success. And so we pray for these individuals that we've just mentioned, and I'm sure there's other burdens and concerns on people's hearts today that weren't maybe mentioned, but uh, there are things that you're concerned about. So. We give all these over to you in faith and trust that our Heavenly Father, who knows best, will answer in the most appropriate form and fashion. 
And now we close this time of prayer by praying the way your son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, both for now and forever. Amen and amen. Our parting hymn is number 451, Like a River Glorious, 451. So I know we have some food back there in the fellowship hall. So we'll ask a blessing upon that. Now, uh, Deborah, yes. can, the, can the choir go have a quick bite to eat before yes. you're going? Okay. So we'll, we'll let the choir go first. They can have a quick bite, and then they got to come back out and practice while the rest of us can have seconds and fellowship. Okay. 11.50. She's such a tough cat. Death, man. Okay. All right. Well, it's been a good day. It's been a good day. We have had a lot of laughter. Ed's very pleased about that looking down. And uh, we continue our fellowship now. May the Lord bless the food that's been prepared for us and our fellowship and our service the rest of this week. Help us to remain faithful until you come back. Help us as we rebuild the church. And we do this in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.